All right, well, let's, let's open up the word together. Let's turn to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 6. You know, there is a first for everything. Here's, here's some firsts that were significant ones throughout the history of mankind. 1492, you know what happened in 1492. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He was the first European from a major power to land in the Americas, which was essentially Bahama, the Bahamas. 1947, Chuck Yeager became the first person to fly faster than the speed of sound. 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary and his Sherpa guide Tenzing Norgay became the first men to climb Mount Everest. In 1903, on December 17th, the Wright brothers became uh, the first men to make powered flight in North Carolina, a flight that lasted only 12 seconds long. In 1215, we had the Magna Carta, which was the first charter which sought to limit the power of a king by law. In 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman, the first female U.S. Supreme Court Justice. 1668, Sir Isaac Newton developed the first reflecting telescope. 490 B.C. was the first marathon. Greek legend says that Philippides, a Greek messenger, ran from the Battle of Marathon to Athens and declared that Greece had won. And you all know what happened to Philippides after that. He died like I would if I had to run a marathon. First modern Olympic Games were in 1896. <clears throat> on, the May, on May 6, 1954, Roger Bannister became the first person to run a mile in under four minutes. In 1440, Johannes Gutenberg invents the world's first printing press, which enables the mass production of books. 1927, Al Jolson became the first star in a talking movie, The Jazz Singer. 1939, Franklin Roosevelt, the first president to speak on television. 1961, Yuri Gagarin, the first man to travel into outer space. 1969, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, the first man to walk on the moon as a part of the Apollo moon landing program. 1979, Margaret Thatcher, the first prime minister of Great Britain. Just a number of firsts. There's one more, of course, that I want to tell you about. There's many firsts that we could go through. Okay, keep going. But the significance of one that I haven't mentioned yet is one that uh, the reason why some of these things are significant is that, is that they, it's not just because it's the first of something necessarily, but in many cases a barrier is broken. And it paves the way for those that follow or lead to other significant accomplishments. And there's there's one more. There's one more significant first that's not known by too many, yet its, it's significant can't be over, significance can't be overstated. In fact, to a great extent, we can trace our being here this morning back to the spirit-empowered boldness of, of one man. By God's providence, he became the first Christian martyr. And that man's name was Stephen. Let's, let's get introduced to Stephen. Let's, let's, in Acts chapter 6. We have the issue that arose that we've already looked at, right, where, where there was uh, tension within the church and, and uh, all oriented around serving tables. And the apostles couldn't be distracted from the preaching of the word and prayer. And so uh, to, to address this very important issue, because it was going to cause division within the church, and and they, they, ra they prayed, and God raised up seven men to serve what would eventually become the office of deacon. And so we see um, in verse 5 of chapter 6, this statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, they brought these men before the apostles, and after prayer, they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men 
from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and argued with Stephen, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, and they came up to him and they dragged him away and they brought him before the council They put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say this Nazarene, Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like that of an angel. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that from it we can gain an understanding of how to live out our Christian lives. And we see that it's not just about being blessed. It's not just about having an abundant life. It's not just about going to heaven and escaping hell. Being a Christian is about living out the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that his sacrifice is has, has accomplished everything pertaining to our salvation. He deserves all the glory. He deserves all the honor, for it was by his work, his work alone that our salvation was accomplished. And so therefore, being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, we see in the example of Stephen involves sometimes living out our faith, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of hatred, in the midst of unrighteous, Christ-hating anger. And the result for the Christian called to live this way is persecution, affliction, and sometimes death. But you are worthy. You are worthy to be lived for. You made it clear that the person who's going to follow Christ must take up his cross. Take up the instrument upon which he may even be crucified upon. You are worthy. You are Lord. You are God. There is salvation in no one else. And so as we look upon and learn from the example of Stephen. I pray that you would grip our hearts with the example of him living out his faith, even to the end. And we pray that through this, and when, when the, should the time come in your providence that we be faced with something similar, that we would remember the example of Stephen and the spirit-empowered witness, bold witness that he gave of Christ. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, a martyr is a person who dies for his or her beliefs. A Christian martyr is a person who dies for his, because of his or her witness to Jesus Christ. I mentioned that that we're here this morning in large part to this man, Stephen. How is that so? Well, it was because of his bold witness that the gospel, and as a result of his death, that the gospel began to spread outside of Jerusalem. So I, I'm, not, I'm not in any way, of course, argue, suggesting that if Stephen had not been martyred, that you and I would not be here. But from a historical perspective, the death of Stephen, the death of Stephen by the hands of the Jews, it served as a catalyst for further persecution of the early church. And in what was most certainly a great tragedy for those who knew and loved Stephen amongst the early church, we can now see the providential outworking of God's plan to spread the gospel in accordance with what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before he ascended. You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even the remotest part of the earth. 
The title for this message is Stephen's Spirit-Empowered Witness. And his witness is in the form, really, of a defense. A defense to the charges that were made by false witnesses in the synagogue that Stephen attended. Specifically, his accusers said that they heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And that he said, Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Now, Stephen's defense was, was really more of an offense than a defense. He never directly addressed the charges against him or said anything like, that's not true, I didn't say that. No, he, he, didn't, he didn't approach it that way. Now, perhaps he, he intended to. Maybe he was going to get to that at some point, but, the, but they drug him outside the city and killed him before he could finish his sermon. Even though he, he very well would have said more, his sermon is longer than any other recorded in the book of Acts. It wasn't the length, though, of his sermon that got him angry. I'm, some of you have probably sat there and said, let's drag Nick outside. He's going a little long. But it wasn't, it wasn't the length of his sermon that got him in trouble. It was his logic. I'll take that laughter as affirmative that that's how some of you feel. The attack on Stephen was really an attack on the gospel and the honor of Jesus Christ. Being full of wisdom and of the Holy Spirit, Stephen masterfully used their own ancestral history to reveal that they were guilty of the very charges that they were bringing against him, and falsely so. And they were guilty to such a degree that not only did they reject the deliverer that God sent, they crucified him. Now, the proof that they understood what Stephen was saying, that they understood that he was really accusing them, was the ferocity of their response, dragging him out mid-sentence and stoning him to death. And after studying uh, what Stephen had to say, which we haven't even entered into yet, I want to give you a summary of what his response is. We, we're just going to keep this in mind this week because we're actually going to look at what Stephen says next week. But here's how I would summarize what he said to the Jews. God rejects all who trust in the work of their hands instead of the perfect righteousness of his son. And with, with that summary, we have to understand that Stephen is looking at them and saying, you've trusted in the work of your hands instead of the righteousness of God's Son. That's what he was saying. But to us, we need to hear that. Are you trusting in the work of your hands? Are you trusting in what you're doing? Are you trusting in who you think you are to save you instead of the perfect righteousness of God's Son? If you are, then... then then may God open your eyes to that as we look at Stephen's defense. It's going to be a very Jewish defense. It's not one that we necessarily relate to. Not in terms of the history, but in terms of the heart we do. We do relate to what the Jews were guilty of, and we need to hear what Stephen has to say. Now, along the way, we'll, we'll come to admire the courage of Christ in Stephen. We need to apply the wisdom of Christ from Stephen. And most importantly, we need to acquire the righteousness of God through Christ. But first, I think it would be worthwhile to appreciate the character of Christ that we see in Stephen. You know, we, we were only just introduced to Stephen, as we saw at the beginning of chapter 6, when he was selected with six other men to serve the body of uh, in the name and by the example of Jesus Christ. That's how he was called to serve. And Luke then closes out this section in chapter 6 <clears throat> with a verse that summarizes the growth of the church in Jerusalem. He does that in verse 7. Take a look there. He says, Luke says, the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming 
obedient to the faith. This is a summary statement. He's saying through the actions of of God's people, Christ is building His church. And God is continuing to pour out His Holy Spirit upon them, creating a genuine love amongst the brethren. There's no denying uh, the mutual love that that wasn't simply in word only amongst these Christians. No, it was in word and it was in deed. And we looked at that. We saw this outpouring of graciousness amongst believers. No one claimed anything for themselves. If you had a need, they wanted to meet it. The summary was that there wasn't a need among them. I mean, that had to have been astounding to the people of of Jerusalem as they looked on and, and saw the care and the love that they had for one another. And the result was that the church grew in both numbers and in influence in the city of Jerusalem. Luke could have simply said, hey, the church grew. But instead, he uses a a somewhat surprising expression, one that personifies the Word of God to a certain extent. He says, the Word of God kept on spreading. Luke is making sure that we understand something about the growth of the church in this statement. The church's growth is a result of something. It's a result of God sending forth His Word through the apostolic preaching where the word is, is, he relates it to a seed. It's growing, and it's growing into a fruitful harvest. True growth in a church, friends. True growth in a church. It's not measured by merely numbers, how many people are showing up on a Sunday. You know, it's, it's measured by whether or not it is the result of that church's commitment to the word, rather than some other means. And there's so many other means that we could employ that would gather a crowd. What good is that? No, the only growth that, that we desire to have here is growth that is connected with the preaching of the Word of Christ. That's true growth. That's growth that God causes, not growth that men can make happen. Now, along with the word increasing, it says the number of the disciples continued to increase. The continued growth was no doubt due to the fact that the apostles were able to do what we saw at the beginning of chapter 6. They were able to be undistracted from all the true needs of the church, and they were able to devote themselves to the prayer and to the ministry of the word. So we see the significance here of having spirit-filled deacons focused on the other needs of the church because that enables the, the pastors of the church then to, to focus on that which is needful for the whole body, which is the preaching of the word and prayer. And so the church is functioning. It's beginning to function as God designed it to. And we see all this beginning to happen right before our eyes. Now, third, Luke mentions that a number of priests believe. Uh, It's been estimated that the size of the priesthood at this time in the history of Jerusalem was quite a large scale, so we we obviously we can't nail it down, but it was anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000. Some say that there were were 8,000 priests um, and then 2,000 Levites. So by saying that they were becoming obedient to the faith, it's just another way of describing a believer in Acts. Boy, what, what a thing that tells us, doesn't it? Obedient to the faith. You can't just simply say, I've received Christ as my Savior without there being a change in your life, without you becoming obedient to what the Scriptures say. If you are saying, I'm a Christian, and your life reflects the world, there's a serious disconnect. That's why... That's why, that's why uh, God and the Spirit inspired Luke to say it this way, so we'd understand. We can't just claim Christ as Savior if He's not Lord of our life, if we're not bowing humbly before Him and submitting our lives to Him. Are you obedient to the faith that you say you believe? You know, this, the fact that so many priests were becoming Christians This must have been a cause for certainly great rejoicing amongst the believers, but it was also a cause of great alarm, no doubt, amongst the Jewish leadership. 
God was clearly blessing the loving witness of the believers and the bold preaching of the apostles. And this means that success in preaching the gospel, it can be measured in two ways. It can be measured by the people who are accepting Christ, but also by those who are persecuting you. If you're preaching the gospel of Christ, Jesus says you're going to be persecuted. And so now we move into the section. Now, that closes out really the, the first section of Acts, of the book of Acts, where the ministry was centered in Jerusalem. And now we're going to begin to see the church under pressure and how it's going to thrive. And some of its leaders are going to lose their lives for their testimony of Christ. The church is now going to be scattered. It's about to be scattered by persecution. And yet, you know what's going to continue to happen? The word is going to continue to increase. We're going to be introduced to the ministries of Philip in Samaria. We're going to watch as God turns a Pharisee named Saul, a persecutor of the church, into a preacher, a powerful preacher of his gospel. But Luke starts, though, with the story of Stephen. Luke describes him with some rather descriptive terms. A man full of faith in the Holy Spirit in verse 5. Full of grace and power in verse 8. We shouldn't be surprised when Luke tells us that, that there were some who were unable in verse 10 to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was preaching. Not with a description like that. So let's look a bit closer at what Luke says in order to appreciate the character of Christ. In Stephen. Let's appreciate the character of Christ in Stephen. There's five qualities of Stephen's character that capture Luke's attention, and they happen to be qualities that are also true of Jesus Christ. And the first, Luke says, is that he was full of faith in verse 5. You know, you can't be saved unless you have faith. We are all saved through faith. It's by grace, through faith, in Christ alone that a person is saved. Faith certainly involves, it involves knowledge. It, it, it involves assent to the truthfulness of certain doctrines. Faith is not something vague. It's not something uncertain. It's grounded in truth about who Jesus Christ is, about what our need is, about the way of salvation. And it's all laid down for us here in Scripture. And yet the experience of faith can differ greatly amongst us can't it? From one Christian to another, their experience of faith can be vastly different. There are those whose faith is strong. And Jesus tells us we're always going to have those around us whose faith is weak. We all face different trials that, that test our faith, namely the assurance of our relationship with Christ. If there's any one place where our faith is most often assaulted and can easily become weak, especially when we've given ourselves over to some sin, it's in the area of our relationship with Christ. Do I really know Him? Look at what I've done. How can I say I know Him when I say these things or when I do these things? But you know, even in those moments, it's not the object of our faith that can be shaken. Christ isn't shaken by your sin. If you're His, you're His. You can't take yourself out of His hand. You can't take yourself out of the Father's hand. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. So it's not the object of our faith that's shaken. It's our experience of our faith. And it should be shaken, especially when we live like we used to live. Now, we need to be those who are obedient to the faith. Because that's, my friends, you're not going to find any joy in sin anymore. Not if you're a follower of Christ. The only way that you're going to know the joy and the pleasure of his, of his gaze upon you is when you're obedient to the faith. Just like, just like he described it of the priests. Be obedient to the faith and know the joy that, that Christ has for you. It's a joy greater than any experience that you can have. Even non-sinful experiences that are, that are joyful, they don't compare. You know, just as an aside too, those who are doing their little victory dances over the Supreme Court decision... This is going to be a great opportunity for the gospel. You know why? Because they think they have everything they need for happiness now. 
and they're going to find that they don't. They're going to find that even though they can do everything that, that society has withheld from them, they're not any happier. And that's where the gospel comes in. There's a reason why you're not happy. There's a reason. It's because the God who made you, you, re, you, you reject him. The one who knows how to satisfy you, you don't want anything to do with. And you think that you can find pleasure in being granted a license for your sin. The opportunity for the gospel is, is here for us, church, and that's how we need to respond. So be sure to be here next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. so we can encourage you in that regard. Luke says that Stephen was a man full of faith in the sense that he was prepared to engage whatever obstacles that he faced in the certainty that God was in complete control of him. His faith gave him a boldness before his persecutors such that he didn't shrink back from the confrontation. It was the truth of who Jesus is. It was the truth of the spiritual blindness of these leaders that emboldened Stephen to make whatever stand in defense of the gospel that, was, that God was asking of him to do, and he did it. We're going to see that. You know, we never know when we're going to be faced with that moment. That moment when we need to stand for the truth of the gospel and the honor of our Savior. It might be in the office. It might be in the break room. It might be in Walmart. It might be in the cafeteria. It might be in the locker room. You have just as much reason to be bold as Stephen. Just as much. You know the truth about Christ and who he is. You know the power of the gospel. And so when that moment comes, remember Stephen's example and be resolute in your faith. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, but Stephen died? Christ is worthy. Has he saved you from your sin? Has he given you the gift of eternal life when you deserved eternal death? You were his enemy. You were. Scriptures say that you hated him. There was enmity between you and him. Did he reject you? Do you go up and embrace those who hate you? Or more inclined to do what they did to Christ in their hatred of him than we are to embrace our enemies. He's worthy of you standing up for him if he calls you to it. It's a great honor to be a witness for Christ and to be persecuted if he calls upon it. Did I say it was easy? No. But as you'll see, Christ has made some promises for those who are going to be bold witnesses for him. We'll see those as we go. You know, along with being full of faith, Luke says that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Since Pentecost, the moment the Spirit regenerates a person and they believe on Christ, that person is baptized with the Holy Spirit. And from that moment on, on the Spirit indwells him and indwells him forever. The Spirit of God dwells in you, Paul said. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. It's not a subsequent experience. It's true of you the moment you put your faith in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized into the life of Christ. It's the Spirit who gifts you to minister, who enlightens you, who causes you to then grow in holiness. Every aspect of your growth in Christ is a re direct result of the Spirit's work in you. But as we saw with Peter when he stood before the Sanhedrin in chapter 4, the Holy Spirit fills a person in a special way in times of difficulty and trial. And this was exactly what Jesus had promised. In Luke chapter 12, verse 11, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. In that very hour. We see the same thing with Paul in chapter 13 when Elimus the sorcerer was trying to dissuade the proconsul Sergius Paulus from becoming a Christian. Paul was there with him. And here's, 
Here's Elymas trying to dissuade the proconsul. Luke says that the Spirit filled Paul to deliver such a sound rebuke, along with, with causing him to go temporarily blind, that the impact that this had upon the proconsul was that he believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. You know, in times of crises, the Spirit comes to our aid also. It isn't just to soundly defend the faith. It may be to endure hardship. It might be to provide comfort to to someone who's hurting. Because we know that he's always with us, you know what we need to begin to do? Learn how to humbly rely upon him. He's with you. Rely upon him. Know that he's with you so that you would rely upon him. And with his help, we can cope with any emergency. We can bear any burden. We can overcome any obstacle. We can flee any temptation. We can endure any pain or press on through any difficulty. We can look to him to fill us again and again for the help in trusting and in praying and in rejoicing. Always. Luke couldn't help but notice Stephen's complete dependence upon the Spirit. Third, Luke says that Stephen was full of grace. The word for grace here, it means kindness, suggesting that Stephen had a charm, had a, had a winsomeness about him. Luke used this word to describe Jesus' teaching in the synagogue, saying, and all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. You know, so we can picture the, 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 the way that he's describing Stephen as he describes the same word. Gracious words falling, they're enamored with Jesus. And he's full of grace. They're enamored with, you can't help but be enamored with Stephen. There's something about him. The overall description that John gave us of Jesus was that he was full of grace and truth. And sinners were drawn to Jesus. Though he was perfectly holy in all his ways, they knew his concern for them was genuine and without judgment. That should also inform us as to how we respond, shouldn't it? If our response is one of judgment, we're not being like Christ. He came to save this first time. And sinners were drawn to him. Even though though they knew they were sinners in his presence, they didn't feel condemned by him. Stephen had known the grace of Christ in his own life, and it had softened him. Knowing the grace of God for us in the gospel should soften us also. It should make us gentle. For Christ was gentle with us, wasn't he? It should make us forgiving and understanding also. Fourth, Stephen was full of power in verse 8. The power that filled Stephen enabled him to perform great wonders and signs among the people, it says. Now up to this point, we've only seen this kind of power associated with the apostles. Similarly, we're told that Paul and Barnabas, they spoke boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. We'll see that in Acts chapter 14. So with such power, while such power was considered a mark of an apostle, there's nothing in Scripture that says that these sign gifts were given only to the apostles. And as we'll see in chapter 8, God performed similar signs with Stephen's fellow deacon, Philip. In Acts chapter 8, it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. It goes on to say that he was casting out demons. They were coming out, shouting in a loud voice. He was healing those who were paralyzed and lame. This is Philip. He's not an apostle. So outside of the apostles... Only Stephen and Philip appear to have been granted such, uh, have been, appear to have been granted such power, and some suggest that all the church really could be doing the miracles like the apostles were doing. And yet, why then are Philip and Stephen the only two doing them? I mean, if it's available to all, why do the scriptures only relate it to the apostles and then Philip and Stephen? That's an interesting question. Additionally. Paul, when he, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, he says, the signs of a true apostle were performed, performed among you all 
uh, performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. It's as if he's saying you can know a true apostle by the things that he does, which includes signs and wonders and miracles. And that statement would be meaningless if any Christian could perform these signs and wonders. Now, I'll tell you right out, we're not told why Stephen and Philip were given the power that appeared to have been uh, only in, given to the apostles. But the best explanation, from my point of view, seems to be connected with the fact that both Stephen and Philip were chosen by the apostles to serve the church in a special capacity as the first deacons. Now remember, when they were chosen, no one was sitting around going, you know, we need some deacons. Let's, let's have the office of deacons. They didn't start that way because that, there was no office. There was the need, right? And they said, let's, let's find the right men to help this need or else the church is going to split. It's going to damage the church. So by the time Paul wrote to Timothy, remember, this was, I was trying to find exactly when about the time frame of Stephen's martyrdom. I think it was roughly about eight years after the ascension of Christ. I could be wrong on that. But Paul wrote to Timothy in 60 AD. So this is 30 more years, roughly. And when he wrote to Timothy 20 to 30 years after the time when the first deacons were chosen, the church had formally recognized the office of deacon. But see, at this point, early on in the life of the church, God saw fit to grant apostolic power to these two men in particular that were specially chosen who would not only minister to the needs of the, of the saints in Jerusalem, but as you're going to see, as we transition into this next section of the book of Acts, where it's going out from Jerusalem to Judea and all Samaria, the gospel, these two men, Stephen and Philip, are put forward by Luke as absolutely instrumental in the spread of the gospel. And so... It, I would say that the Spirit inspired Luke to, to be drawn to these two men because God chose these men to be particular, to use them in a particular way to spread his gospel, as he said it would spread. Now, fifth, Stephen, it says, was full of wisdom. We see the impact of the wisdom that God gave Stephen on the Jewish members of the synagogue that Stephen attended. Stephen was most likely a Hellenistic Jew. We were first exposed to what a Hellenistic Jew is when we looked at uh, the situation that was brewing at the beginning of Acts chapter 6. But, but a Hellenistic Jew was essentially someone who was born and raised outside of Israel. Uh, remember that Israel had many times had been brought into captivity, Babylonia being one of the key ones. Um, and so many of the Jews who went into exile... You know, eventually they planted their roots. They were still Jews, but they just sunk their roots in Babylon, and they continued to live there. And many of those Jews and their children, their posterity, uh, having been in Babylon for many years, many of them eventually made their way back to Israel, but that was not where they were from anymore. They were now really born and raised outside of Israel. And then there were the Hebrews. Remember, that was the other group. There were the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebrews. And the, Hisri and the Hebrews were Israelites, born and raised. And as we saw in the chapter, this created a social distinction between these two groups that often kept them separate from one another. The Hellenistic Jews were, were Jewish as to their faith, but they were immigrants nevertheless, and with the entire social stigma that so often belongs to being an immigrant. Hey, we, you may do that where you're from, but here in, in Jerusalem, this is how we do things, right? It creates that kind of feeling amongst them. And that's why this was a true issue that needed to be dealt with in the early church. Now, Christians in Jerusalem, they typically, they typically attended. At this time, they were still attending both the temple and the local synagogue. They would eventually come to, to break from all of this, but right now they were still attending both. And Luke describes one of those synagogues in verse 9. He calls it the synagogue of the freedmen. And in this synagogue of the freedmen were Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia. So who were these freedmen's? Well, the freedmen were descendants of those who had been liberated from slavery or imprisonment following the war in the time of Pompeii, which was about 63 B.C. And this synagogue 
had kind of formed, and those who were, these were Hellenistic Jews because they were from outside of Israel, and they'd come together and they'd essentially created their own synagogue, the synagogue of the freedmen, and it, and it was largely Hellenistic in its attendance. So the Jews that were there were from all these different parts of the Roman Empire. Cilicia, which um, was also happened to be the hometown of Paul, of Tarsus. He was there as well as people from Asia. But interesting, think about this. If Paul, who was at this time still called Saul, if he attended this synagogue, he might possibly have heard what Stephen had actually been saying as opposed to the false accusations that were leveled against him. And perhaps this is why we find Saul in attendance at Stephen's execution, because he heard him himself in the synagogue. In any event, Luke says in chapter 6, verse 10, that they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And as we're going to see when we look at his defense, God had given Stephen an insight into the Old Testament that resulted in views that were very different from those of the Jewish members of the synagogue. And his wisdom was unassailable. Why? Because it was rooted in the scriptures. He could show them why what he was saying was true and they had no answer for it. And as a result of his understanding of what Jesus had accomplished and what the Holy Spirit had affirmed, Stephen, he provoked a dispute amongst the Jewish members of the synagogue. And as we're going to see, he argued for a radical discontinuity from the Old Testament. It was essentially the new covenant that Jesus had spoken of but it, it proved to be too new, too new for these unbelieving Jews in the synagogue. They weren't ready for that yet. They didn't see Jesus as the Messiah, and so they didn't see the end of sacrifices in the temple. So now that we understand Stephen's character to be the same as Christ, it's going to help us to understand why the Jews treated him in much the way, same way that they treated Jesus. You know, godliness is always going to be opposed by the world, but in Stephen's case, his godliness was coupled with an unwavering desire to continue the dialogue that Jesus had begun about the temple, a dialogue that had incensed the Jews to murder him. And in this, we can admire the courage of Christ in Stephen. I'm going to go ahead and finish that out. We're, we'll run a little bit long, but... If I don't say it this week, it probably won't get said because there's a lot to say next week. So let's look at the courage of Christ in Stephen. The dispute that arose in the synagogue of the freedmen was, was because the Jews greatly objected to what Stephen had been saying about the relationship of the Christian church to aspects of the law of Moses. So despite their best efforts, they, they weren't able to cope with Stephen's wisdom. And mind you, neither Stephen nor any of the other apostles or, or the evangelists had any sort of formal training. The only one that we know did was Paul, and that was under the rabbi Gamaliel. So how then do, they, do we explain Stephen's amazing wisdom? The short answer is Jesus promised it. We see this in Luke 21, 15. Jesus says, I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents which will be able to resist or refute. Can you see the providence of God? Can you see that, that, that as history unfolds, it's truly his story? He's writing this story because he told the church well in advance exactly what we see happening right here. They're not going to be able to resist or refute the wisdom that I will give you. So as Stephen spent time himself in the scriptures, the spirit gave him the mind of Christ. And the more that they disputed with Stephen, the more that they became frustrated. And in the end, when you're so frustrated but you want to win, what do you do? You cheat. That's what they did. They cheated. It's 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. The main charge that these false witnesses brought against Stephen was very serious. Verse 13, they put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this, this holy place, the temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Few things were more important to the Jews of Jerusalem than the religious rituals and the culture that was associated with the temple. You mess with the temple, you bring on the wrath of the Jews. 
They cared more about the outward formalities associated with the temple than any sort of inward grace that God would be doing in their lives. The temple of Herod had been under construction for about half a century when Jesus came along and said that he would destroy the temple and then build it up again in three days. Only Jesus wasn't speaking about the literal temple, but figuratively about his own body and the resurrection that would follow his death. And what he said got him in trouble, as did Stephen when he referenced what Jesus said about the temple. Stephen was likely citing Jesus' words as part of his argument for Jesus' death having rendered the temple insignificant, the sacrifices that were done there. The temple was where the Levitical priests offered the ritual sacrifices for the sins of the people. Jesus, however, laid down his life on behalf of his people's sins. And since his death atoned for their sins, there would be no more need for the temple. They had been blind to the truth of what Jesus had said in Matthew 16 when he says, but I say to you, something, there is something greater than the temple here. He's referring to himself. I'm greater than this temple. So Stephen now stands before the council. And Luke says that, that when they looked at him in... Uh, Verse 15. And when they looked at him, they were fixing their gaze on him. Luke uses the same word for how the 11 remaining apostles observed Jesus as he attended to, uh, ascended up to heaven. Do you think that they were looking pretty intently at Jesus as he ascended? That's how the council's looking at Stephen. Same word. And when they looked intently at him, Luke says, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like that of an angel. Kind of a strange, almost little sentimental sound to it. They were looking at the face of an angel. That's like a mother saying, my, my little angel, it seems like. But I don't think Stephen meant it in a sentimental way. There's only one other person in Scripture that has a similar description about him. And that was Moses when he came down from having received the law on Mount Sinai. He'd been with God. He'd received the tablets of the law, and his face was shining. His countenance was shining. It would seem that Luke was saying Stephen also reflected a touch of God's glory. He was accused of blaspheming Moses, showing disrespect for the law that Moses had gave it. And yet Luke here, what's he doing? He's uniquely identifying him with something that was true only of Moses. You know what this is? This is Luke's way of saying Stephen was innocent of all these charges. Now next week, we're going to look at the exact nature of what Stephen was saying about God, about the temple, about Moses, and about the law. And the essence of what we're going to see when we look at it is that God rejects all who trust in the work of their hands instead of the perfect righteousness of his son. So come next week and we'll, we'll dive into those details. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you've given us true living examples that we can learn from ourselves. It's not just a bunch of doctrine laid out in your word. It's lives lived that we can relate to. Stephen was a real person. Stephen had a real faith that was rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And every one of us here in this room possess the same, who knows you, possess the same spirit within them that Stephen had. And it should be our desire to be as full of faith and the spirit and wisdom and power as Stephen was, not so that we would get any honor or glory, but so that Christ and his gospel would receive all the honor and glory he deserves, even at the, at the offering of our lives and proclaiming it, for you are worthy. Many of us are sitting here seeing such a gap between where we are today and the example of Stephen. Let us be reminded of the promises that you've given the church, that you'll be with us in that hour. You'll give us wisdom. You'll give us power. But it begins now. We can't just live however we want and expect that to be there. Stephen was a man of your word. Stephen was a man of prayer.
and he lived in dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we'll do the same, we can expect to have a great witness for your glory as well. And may that be our heart's desire and what we pursue. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.